Um, Dr. Osgood will be recording his uh, presentation, and he has a, a YouTube channel where he posts most of his work and presentations. So what we will do is reserve questions to the end, um, and prior to questions, uh, Nick will stop the recording. So um, if anyone has any concerns about their name being out there, you, you, you don't have to worry about that because um, the recording will only be while he presents and we'll stop the recording um, at the end. So, uh, say the questions to me again. And will the chat be uh, recorded or not, or can we just go in the chat to write our questions? Um, I think you're going to be going to full screen. Nick, do you know if the, if the chat gets captured yeah exactly um uh the chat is not captured in my recording uh, i will be in full screen mode so i won't see the chat until i'm done with the presentation um you know i could try to connect via phone as well i'm just um uh, i'll make an effort to do so uh, so i can monitor the chat but i i can't promise that you know i'll be able to do that all throughout so um, it's just that we can start writing our questions as we absolutely. hear them, so that's just easier. That's uh, that's my only question I had. Yeah, yeah, that that's yeah, right. Yeah, so don't don't worry, uh, Nate, about trying to follow the chat. I will track if there are questions. I will track the questions and I'll prioritize them at the end. Okay, uh, terrific. Uh, thanks so much, and Amir, if you wouldn't mind speaking up, if audio does become a problem, I can I can switch over to my phone audio in that case. Yeah. Okay. Perfect, um, thanks. Yeah. Uh, so uh, thanks so much, everyone. It's uh, it's an honor to be able to share with you some of our work that cross cross leverages uh, machine learning in the form of uh, Bayesian computational statistics with transmission modeling to integrate wastewater surveillance and, and health system data. Now, uh, this is a diverse audience um, uh, on this call. Uh, some are seasoned modelers, uh, probably interested in the nitty gritty details. Others um, are in a capacity to support modeling with wastewater surveillance data and um, are probably more interested in the big picture. Um, I'm going to be trying to provide something for each of those groups, making sure that everyone goes away with some good intuitions and some concrete sense of what's delivered here while recognizing that um, I, uh, particularly in light of the 20 minutes I've been allotted, I'm gonna have to go light on a lot of the particular details. Um, and I'm happy to you know, answer questions about those um, uh, upon the conclusion of the presentation itself. Um, so this work is uh, a component of our uh, reporting relationships uh, that uh, have been conducted with our provincial authorities since uh, March of 2020. Um, to PHAC for uh, each of the provinces, uh, to FNIB for First Nations uh, reserves in six provinces, and to our university, um, uh, which is starting to, to measure wastewater in dorms. Uh, so this leverages um, uh, a sophisticated infrastructure, which we have in place for day-to-day -day reporting, but has extended it with wastewater, um, uh, wastewater inputs. And, and really it's on that side and can be starting to talk. We also have some exciting work going on in Alberta with making use of 11 um, wastewater treatment plants results through a collaboration with Lily Pong at Precision Labs, the, uh, the, the central laboratory of, of Alberta. Um, so in, in many ways, the impetus for this work lies in the fact that, you know, decision makers have to make sense of an underlying um, situation on the basis of diverse streams of, of data. And those working like myself um, with the health system from the beginning of the pandemic will recognize that, you know, over time, uh, we've collected uh, 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 quite a large array of different types of uh, health system data, whether it's cases or admissions to hospital or ICU census, et cetera. Um, and uh, these exhibit, sometimes complex reciprocal relationships with presentations driving tests and, and with uh, active case finding, uh, say through drive-through sites or contact tracing, driving discovery of new cases that makes interpretation challenging. And when we bring wastewater data to the table, you know, we have at once a greater opportunity to give insight as to the underlying situation, particularly in terms of number of, uh, number of infected individuals, 
but it, it, it raises some additional texture of those challenges. Uh, for example, um, trying to understand how many of those are likely undiagnosed. Um, what does this mean in terms of the force of infection and the number of new infections um, occurring per day? Um, and, uh, you know, beyond that, um, when we look at sort of streams of input data, that there's a lot they don't tell us about where things are going. Where is our ICU census going to go in the next few weeks? What are our, our hospital admissions going to look like? Um, and what can we expect in, in terms of uh, an understanding of the mortality burden? So uh, to address uh, this issue of interpretation, many have turned, of course, to dynamic modelers, and particularly for their what-if uh, capacity to answer what-if questions. And this work makes use of uh, dynamic models uh, together with this empirical data. Dynamic models that seek to depict um, a posited um, flow of, of the natural history of infection, uh, of transmission, um, and, and seek to use that to ask what if questions and project forward. But often these models uh, raise challenges in integrating and, and being uh, kept current with the sort of evidence we see here. And really what we're talking about today is a machine learning approach that combines transmission models with rich empirical data, including wastewater data, to really understand uh, what's going on in the underlying uh, situation. These aren't curve-fitting approaches. They are Bayesian approaches, but they're not uh, you know, Bayesian attempts to, to do curve-fitting. They're Bayesian attempts to estimate the underlying state of the system as represented by a dynamic model. Um, and this method is trying to understand a coherent understanding, one that's consistent with the natural history of infection captured in this, in this model about how infection um, proceeds in different people, say those with frank symptoms or those who are oligosymptomatic, and relate it to what we see in wastewater data and other types of data. And it involves inference from, from observed data in ways that square with this natural history of infection captured by the model. Um, and once you do that, we can not only give a, a better grounded estimate uh, probabilistically of what's the situation right now, but we can project forward and ask what if questions. So that, you know, in a nutshell is kind of the biggest picture um, understanding of what's going on here. And I would appeal to another common example of this in, in terms of weather models. Um, you know, we all look to uh, weather models to help guide us as to tomorrow's weather. But we'll all recognize that a weather model created as of June 1st and projecting tomorrow's weather, if we relied on that, we'd be a lot worse off in terms of accuracy and, and uh, expectations than if we relied on the same model um, today, its projections for tomorrow. And why? Because it's been regrounded with evidence about what's actually happened all along. And that's what we're doing here. We're taking our transmission models and we're regrounding them with evidence as to what's actually happened and using that to interpret the current situation and project forward. So uh, going a little bit deeper, uh, we're taking a variety of types of data. This includes wastewater data, um, and we'll talk more about the form of that, but health system data um, to the present and uh, together with the transmission model and using these uh, Bayesian machine learning techniques, we use it to estimate the current situation probabilistically as a distribution. Um, how many people there are in this, uh, this newly infected, latently infected state or, or with a pre-symptomatic state or with early stage symptoms or late stage symptoms or who are oligosymptomatic. And we use it to interpret the situation and project forward, uh, going forward for what if questions or, or sort of business as usual case. So, um, uh, you know, in a little bit more detail yet, uh, Bayesian machine learning combines this dynamic model with, um, uh, with, with an understanding of, of what's actually observed to uh, inform an understanding of the current situation as depicted by the model. And it uses wastewater as well as traditional data for that. And the strategy can be applied to most ODE models. There's nothing particularly privileged about the model we're using here, um, it, it could be used with a wide variety of other models. And, uh, you know, having done that, we can project forward, ask what if questions. Um, and this is a technique which doesn't rely on continuous wastewater data, but it can be merely episodic, for example. And we 
exploit it when it's available. And when it's not, um, we're just relying on, on more traditional health system data sources. Um, uh, the techniques we use are called particle filtering, which is a sequential Monte Carlo uh, uh, computational statistics method, and particle MCMC, which I'm, I'm not going to be able to talk about because of reasons of time, but it's more sophisticated yet, and which has started to yield real insight. Um, uh, we do have experience integrating this with, um, uh, with some municipalities in Saskatchewan and Alberta, um, but we're working to refine it in a great deal of detail. I'm going to go into um, some, more, um, some more specifics now. So the two primary techniques we're using are particle filtering, which estimates the underlying state of the system given the observed data and fixed assumptions about uh, most parameter values. Um, and the other technique is particle MC, which allows for jointly estimating parameter values in the underlying state of the system. Um, both of these are used in our day-to-day -day work and have proved uh, very complementary and insightful. Now, um, this work relies on a transmission model, and I've shown that, uh, but it, I want to emphasize one component before I explain how particle filtering works. If you take a transmission model like this, at any one point, um, it's going to uh, have uh, a representation at a given point of time as to how many people are susceptible, how many people are in a latently infected state or pre-symptomatic or early stage infection, how many people are remain undiagnosed or are diagnosed as that, those D subscripts here. And over time, uh, say as people get infected, they'll move from susceptible to exposed state. Um, as people get diagnosed through active case finding, they'll move to a diagnosed state or through uh, passive case finding, they'll, um, they'll flow in via some of these, uh, these purple arrows. Um, now, uh, at any one time, there's a certain number, as it were, in each of these compartments, counting the number of people there right now. That's what a traditional dynamic model gives you. At a given time, for each of these compartments, there's a certain uh, value that indicates the number of people in that compartment at that time. And so we could summarize the state of the model with what's called a state vector that, that simply says how many, what's the number in this state, this state, this state, et cetera. Now, uh, particle filtering, and, and by extension, particle MCMC, which includes particle filtering as a component, um, takes this idea further. Um, so uh, it leverages it, but it leverages it um, in a more sophisticated way. Specifically, uh, particle filtering is this approach which will run a, a transmission model and then correct it when we see an observation. It will correct its understanding of the state of the particle filtering model in light of the new observation to have a more savvy understanding that, that has taken into account the observation. Um, but it does so in a very particular way. Specifically, um, it's, uh, it's considering a wide variety of hypotheses for what that, understand, what that situation is within the, the external world uh, at any one time. And these hypotheses compete with one another to explain the data. You can imagine taking this model and extending it out of the screen. So we have different layers of it. And each layer um, is its own version of the model, which uh, at any one time has a value for each of these stocks and each of these state variables. And Collectively, there's a wide variety of different uh, such understandings amongst these different layers or different so-called particles or samples. Each of these particles has a different hypothesis about the, what the underlying situation is right now, and they kind of jockey for position to explain the data to this point. So some of them will be more consistent with the data than others, and not all of these are considered equal. If, if it's if a particle is consistently in line with the data, we'll give it a higher weight. Um, if it's less consistent, we'll give it a lower weight. And one that has a weight of two will be twice as well represented in the distribution as one with a weight of one. And what's going on here is that any particle believes hard. It never changes its mind. But what changes over time is our sense of the credibility of different particles. And we invest in those that are credible and we downplay those that are less credible. And there's a survival of the fittest in a process called resampling by which 
those that are most competitive in explaining the data flourish and survive and multiply, and those that are less consistent die out. And so that, at a very high level, is how particle filtering works. We're running this model in parallel. We're, compete, we're uh, competing uh, with the different particles for complaining the data, these jockeying hypotheses. And uh, we are investing in those that are more consistent with the data. And over time, we get a picture emerging that's more and more clear about the underlying situation. This whole process is performed recursively. And what that means is, it's a fancy term, but when a new data point arrives, Basically, we don't have to consider all the data to this point. We just uh, update the weights to reflect the new data point, which is computationally um, frugal and which also uh, is conceptually um, uh, rather pleasing. Okay, so uh, each particle has a specific value for a state vector at any given time, and they try to compete to explain the observations. I'm going to go light on this, but I just want to say at the observation point is where the accounting takes place. It's at observations that particles are given more credibility by increasing their weight or given less credibility if they're at odds with the empirical data by downplaying their weight. Um, there's a process for this that I'd, I'd love to talk more about, but uh, you know, fundamentally each particle is a state vector, has a current situation it believes is the case. Is it, it has a prediction for what should be going on right now empirically. We compare it with the empirical data, and using a likelihood function, we compute um, a likelihood for each of its observations or each of its predictions against the corresponding observation. And those likelihoods uh, collectively define a composite likelihood that's used to adjust the weights. Um, this is basically how it takes place. Particles that are more consistent with this data will be up-weighted uh, comparatively, and those that are less consistent with the data will be down-weighted. Um, and a resampling process takes place whereby particles that are highly weighted are multiplied, and those that are less weighted are, are, are die out. Okay, um, so uh, how do we deal with, uh, with wastewater data? Well, wastewater data is one part of a composite likelihood function. It's one component. There's a likelihood subfunction associated with, with wastewater data. Um, I won't go into the other forms of the other likelihood functions, but I'll talk a little bit about the, the, li the likelihood function used for wastewater. The others uh, mirror um, uses in the literature going back to about, 19, uh, to about 20, 2013 or so on with the work of Dora Gotti and some of our early work in this area. Um, so the wastewater likelihood function is going to be linking up what a particle expects in terms of um, a wastewater concentration with what's actually observed. And we've, we've examined three forms of these likelihood functions. Currently, we use a log normal function. Um, and uh, for different municipalities, there's um, uh, some model structural changes that can be required to reflect, say, delays in transit. In Saskatoon, we have only a six-hour delay. In larger municipalities, we may have a larger delay from homes to wastewater treatment plant that requires some model staging to, to capture the effects of that delay. And we're working with these 11 uh, different wastewater treatment plants in Alberta that's forcing us to, to engage in some, uh, some modifications for different municipalities um, in our work with Lily Pong's lab. Uh, so uh, I will just say that a, a key component of this, I'm watching my time here, is a representation of the shedding population. And uh, at any one time in the model, we could count the number of people who are currently infective. That's the people shown in this kind of uh, reddish color and we could total them up. But as a, as a shedding model, that's not gonna be uh, as effective as one that represents the people, the fact that people through the course of their uh, infection shed different amounts uh, at different times. And those in early stages tend to shed more than those in later stages. Um, this is documented in the literature with, with actually a log linear decrease in the amount of viral load uh, with days past sy symptom onset after about a day or two of infection. Um, it's log linear, meaning it decreases exponentially. So you tend to get a better fit, and this is borne out in our experiments, with weights that are much higher for those at the early stage of infection. Those at the later stage are shedding less per day, 
and are therefore weighted down. We could elaborate it. If, um, we haven't gotten to that point yet, but for oligosymptomatic individuals, often associated with lower viral load, uh, for example, um, and uh, that is a, a direction we're interested in taking. So when we have a likelihood function, we have this kind of weighted representation of the shedding. And the very simplest form of this likelihood is to, to have a, a constant multiplied by that, which translates into a concentration estimate at the current, if we had measured it at the current time. And we can uh, use, for example, a log normal distribution or a gamma distribution to compare that, uh, that, that data we see with, uh, with, in fact, what's actually observed. And that allows us to kind of uh, align what we see from the model with what's observed empirically. And um, this is something which uh, uh, can be used to as, as a key part of this inference about how many people are likely infected out there. Now, to capture weight, uh, delays in wastewater, we can use the staged model structure. Time is running out, and I don't have time to go into this in detail. But basically, it involves several stages, which de delay the signal, essentially, in the model from the shedding population now over successive days so that we can get out a representation of what it was three days ago or two days ago. Um, OK, I, I'd just like to, to comment a little bit on a few additional aspects of this. We've judged uh, the efficacy of this model in a couple of ways. Uh, one way is, is by comparing the posterior estimates of the model against empirical data for those quantities for which we have empirical data. And that, those results have shown that incorporating wastewater makes the model more accurate in its ability to match uh, health system data, ICU census, uh, hospital census, uh, ICU admissions, as well as cases, et cetera. Um, we also have used it, it to, to understand, we've also investigated the impact of wastewater on projection accuracy. So if we, if we have a model informed by wastewater, does it predict forward um, where health system quantities are going, where ICU census will be going over the next two weeks more accurately? And in short, the answer is yes, it does. Wastewater data does allow us beyond cases and including things uh, involved in uh, acute care to predict better those factors using a model informed by wastewater. So um, there's a statistically significant improvement that we see by incorporating wastewater. These are actually rather old results back till April. Uh, we have some updated results that bear this out, but further, uh, further have shown that smoothed wastewater data, where we smooth data, multiple data samples from within a week um, actually yields better accuracy yet than just raw wastewater samples fed into the model on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, okay, so why do you do this? Well, one, one thing that emerges is kind of a population tomography. Um, those on the call may be familiar with devices like CAT scans or MRIs. Um, these are devices that secure great value, not because the images, any one image coming out of the device uh, in, a, in isolation is that much better. A given image here will, will have occlusions, it will have shadows cast in it, incomplete field of view, et cetera. But the real value comes in knitting together these pictures, uh, these many, many pictures from different angles into a single consistent 3D view of the underlying situation. And that's what we get out of these methods. We can get out of them an understanding of, of what empirically measured values should be, things like suspected cases or wastewater concentration, and make sure that the model is jiving with those for sure. But what's more significant is we can use it to estimate things like undiagnosed infectives, um, force of infection, um, the, the number of, of people getting newly infected per day, those at early or late stage of infection. And really, that's what we do with these models. It, it's not so much that they reproduce empirical data. That's just a prerequisite. We use them to understand the underlying latent situation, including the effective reproductive number, which is often of primary interest. A second thing we do is project forward with them. And here, you know, we might project forward, for example, ICU census. And that's been of central interest here in our province uh, from use of these methods for over the past year and continues to be of, of considerable, um, considerable um, centrality in people's uses day-to-day uh, -day of the results. 
So this whole process of being a computer scientist and someone who teaches software engineering and, and software development processes, uh, we of course put together a replicable pipeline, mostly automated for this whole process that allows this to be uh, largely run in an automated fashion day to day, um, ingesting data from, mul from multiple sources, processing it automatically, spitting out reports that are uploaded or sent to our stakeholders. Okay, so, you know, I've rushed through, it's been a whirlwind tour. I'd like to offer some, some final summaries before opening it up to questions. Um, so big picture, what this is about is combining machine learning and dynamic modeling. It's combining rich data sources and uh, transmission models that capture in some sense the theory of how a system behaves, the natural history of infection, how transmission occurs, and uses machine learning, Bayesian machine learning, to knit those together into a consistent picture of what's going on in the underlying system, including acute care concerns and a uh, number of undiagnosed individuals, et cetera. Particle filtering use of wastewater data allows um, uh, the model output, even for health system quantities, to much better match what we see from the world. So wastewater matters and it matters for acute care data, for cases, um, and it sharpens our model understanding. And we're using this in our regular reporting, our production reporting, for example, to provincial authorities with wastewater in informed uh, estimates. Beyond providing uh, an estimate of the current situation, it allows us to project forward and ask what if questions, often of key interest involving, say, acute care utilization and demand. Um, it does improve uh, the accuracy of wastewater data, improves the accuracy of our projections, and um, it can be incorporated in a relatively straightforward way by representation of a shedding model, um, potentially depending on your infrastructure with representations of delays, um, of factors having to do with smoothing due to wastewater mixing from different days, uh, temperature effects, etc. Uh, it does sc scale to handle episodic wastewater data or ongoing. It can handle each of them equally well and uh, can handle different levels of delay in securing that data. Um, we were, in our very early work, uh, aided by you know, very um, simple infrastructure in place here in Saskatoon, separate stormwater and wastewater systems, for example, short transit times. But we're in the midst of learning uh, from others, including Peter's group and, and others, about you know, really monitoring, modeling the, uh, the underlying infrastructure better. And we have a lot of work to do, but we're cutting our teeth with that in Alberta. Um, and this approach, you know, is readily adapted to different dynamic models. There's nothing special about this one uh, that we use, and uh, many published models could be used in this sort of way. Um, uh, it does require a large computational uh, uh, infrastructure to support it, um, uh, and we use hundreds of thousands of these competing hypotheses at any one time to get best results within this. So I'd like to thank those who made this work possible. Amir for the kind invitation to present. Um, I'd like to offer specific thanks to Lu Jie Duan and, and uh, Xiaoyan Li here who have provided the, uh, the foundational work uh, uh, to put this, uh, put this infrastructure and the model in place for wastewater and, and other components. And I'd like to uh, thank our partners, those in Alberta, those in Saskatchewan, Dr. John Giese's lab, and other partners who have made this work possible and those who have inspired it. So thanks so much. And I'm gonna be stopping recording right now.